So my name is Shelly Reed, and we're here today with um, many, many, many members of the Just Tech team. And, and um, Taylor, would you like to introduce them all? Um, when I, I'll hand it over to you if you would like to do so. And this is an open forum meeting. We're here to discuss SharePoint, we're to commiserate, to impart a, you know, a little bit of wisdom, um, to share how we're using it. But it really is an audience participation event for you to ask the questions that are burning, you know, keeping you up at night. Um, so please participate. And if you'd like to turn cameras and mics on, you're welcome to do so. I think the webinar turned them off on you on the way in. I apologize. We'll fix that for next time. But I'm going to turn over to Taylor and she's going to introduce some Just Tech staff. And we'll go from there. Thanks, Shelley. Thanks all for joining us today. Um, we're very excited to answer your questions. Who we have joining us from Just Tech today, um, we have consultants, we have a technical support unit lead, and we have John, our founder and president, Rucha and Tony, our consultants, and um, they are bringing their SharePoint expertise from doing many SharePoint migration projects all at the same time. And Tony is also um, working with programs in Ohio to do SharePoint intranet sites. Tim leads our technical support unit. So he's the person who is making sure that people in real time are getting answers to their questions and all of their IT needs. And Adnan is um, a SharePoint expert. Um, we rely on Adnan when we have SharePoint architect questions, SharePoint expert questions, things that we can't figure out, we go to Adnan. So he'll be he'll be a great resource for you all today and um, he'll be answering questions and sharing his expertise from the back end to the front end. Um, my name is Taylor. I'm a project manager and Shelly and I will both be moderating a bit, um, but as Shelly said, feel free to unmute and just ask questions. Shelly, did we get any questions prior to the call that we could start with? The not really questions per se. We had one person say that they needed to know everything. <laughs> so it, get, getting started for beginners, I guess. And then the other comment was um, if you had any tips for um, legal aid organizations with very small budgets. Okay. So speaking of the know everything question, Adnan, would you like to start with what you were thinking about going from the back end to the front end, kind of explaining how SharePoint hangs together? Yeah, sure, Taylor, I can, I can take that one. So SharePoint, right, as Taylor mentioned, can be used for, for many purposes, right? It can be an intranet, it can be an extranet to collaborate with external collaborators, external partners, it can be used as a document management system, which is really its initial purpose. A lot of people that have used SharePoint over the years may see it mainly as a document management system. Right? And, and over the years, I think SharePoint, Microsoft's done a good job of improving the intranet and extranet functionality and capabilities, as well as automation. Right? There's a suite of applications now that integrate to SharePoint on the workflow side, right? Power Automate, Power Apps and Power BI on the business intelligence side of things. Um, and a lot of the core applications do sit uh, or use SharePoint uh, very closely. OneDrive uses SharePoint for storage as does Microsoft Teams. Uh, I think that's a good overview. I mean, we can take a deeper dive as questions come up. Okay, awesome. Um, one question we just got in the chat from John Whitfield is, could you screen share some good examples? So in terms of examples, um, when you create a, a SharePoint site out of the box, right? Microsoft gives you uh, a look and feel. And if you create what's called a, a communication site, there's a, a template that comes along with that. Um, we, we could create one here on the call uh, potentially, but what I want to mention is Microsoft also now has a what's called a lookbook they've made available where you can actually import a lot of these pre-canned templates. So your SharePoint site looks less like SharePoint. Right? A lot of people have some preconceived notions that, oh, I don't want to use SharePoint. Or I don't want my site to look like SharePoint. So 
the lookbook helps you achieve that. In terms of examples, I don't know, Taylor, do you think we should actually create a site? I mean, that might take a couple of minutes, or maybe I create one in the back end while we're taking other questions so it's there to, to show some people. What do you think? We could do that. I know Just Tech has a demo environment we could share as well. Okay. Yeah, you want to do that? That's Sure. We, we kind of can't share um, uh, provider sites. But we're not at liberty to do that. So unfortunately, yeah. that's. But but if there are folks, again, there. I see some some uh, um, uh, representatives of providers that have um, both intranets and and some DMS. So, so if you're, if you feel at liberty to share, um, as well, we could do a screen share. But it, but, uh, yeah, I think I think Taylor, if we can show show yeah. a demo site we have and and sure, uh, <clears throat> I can go ahead and start one up. Thank you. Uh, I do need to be given share permissions, though, Shelley, if you can. <clears throat> and well, while we're doing Shall that, again, work work workflows, um, you know, I think are really you know sort of powerful function of SharePoint um, for you know routing and improving documents and and. Uh, you know, for HR or fiscal purposes, or even for um, litigation related documents. Any, anyone want to talk, talk about that? Yeah, we can talk about workflows, definitely. Um, maybe we can just kind of get people um, sort of oriented to some of the components of SharePoint um, and the sort of standard uses that we've seen and then get into, I, I would think of workflows as a more intermediate kind of step in implementing SharePoint. So the <clears throat> what we're showing here is a demo uh, intranet site that we've set up um, to give people a sense of what you can use um, within SharePoint to, to convey information to your staff. Um, and so many of you may already have intranet sites like this. Um, you may even be using SharePoint for them. One of the key things that we've found as we're implementing is it's not so much SharePoint that can be the barrier to getting up and running with an internet. It's whether you have thought through how you want to convey information. So um, as you can see, this is, um, you know, it, it the modern SharePoint definitely looks nicer and flashier than the, the classic version of it. Um, and it has some cool um, Sort of modern web features like this uh, this component here called the Hero Web Part can does a little bit of animation when you hover over images, and that's really good for being able to draw people's attention to set to certain pieces of information. Um, <clears throat> there's also things like um, a news feature that allows you to kind of it's almost like a blog, right? And so um, a lot of organizations will have executive directors to who um, will sort of run. A, a news feed, um, an HR lead might also have their own. And you can also create a version of this that aggregates across multiple feeds. So on the home page, you might have one from the executive, you might have a feed that um, shows all of the updates from the executive director, HR, IT, whoever. But then you could go to the individual sites, like the H individual HR site and look at the feed just for HR. <clears throat> that also applies to events, right? So beyond just being a place to keep documents, SharePoint is sort of a full featured information management system as well. And it can actually even function as a, sort of a, a lightweight database if you start using um, SharePoint lists too. So there's a lot that um, can really be done. I think if you are thinking about embarking on an internet project, you really want to think about not so much um, the visual as design aspects, but more of the information architecture and how you want everything to kind of connect to each other. Um, most internets I've seen have sort of gravitated to having um, various sites based on um, departments. Um, and what we've kind of been encouraging is thinking about using two different hubs. So you have your main administrative hub and also now a legal services hub. And the reason we, we've started trying to kind of encourage this model is that it allows you to segregate your searches across the two sites. So, you know, in your administrative hub, that might be where your staff go to look for things like um, the 
HR policy manual or a leave request form. But in the legal services side of things, they may be looking more for things like uh, sample memos or uh, sample filings or um, you know practice guides. And to have all of those combined in the same search may actually make the search a little bit harder to use. So we've sort of encouraged breaking those into two different hubs with multiple sites attached to each um, each hub. So this would be the legal services site hub with you know practice group specific sites or even project specific sites. And um, we found also many organizations are starting to want to integrate um, SharePoint as their document management for their case files and um, and actually integrate with with their case management system. And so the one that um, we've we have the most experience integrating with um, SharePoint is Legal Server. Um, and so this would be an example of you can keep all of your cases in SharePoint, case documents within SharePoint, but within Legal Server, you could uh, go to the case profile for this case and um, see essentially these documents within Legal Server without having to go to SharePoint to look for your case files. Um, so that's, that's sort of an overview of kind of in broad strokes what we've been doing with SharePoint with many of our clients. Um, and this is just one example. Um, there have also been organizations using it to create extranet sites, so sites to share information with external people, um, such as volunteers or board members. Um, and then there's another organization using it to build out uh, a uh, a call, a, a hotline um, sort of knowledge base guide for volunteers to be able to quickly access information about, you know, um, a legal issue that somebody's calling about, um, but using SharePoint and its powerful kind of search and, and information management capabilities to do that. Thanks so much, Tony. Tony will be here for the first half of the call. So if you have any questions for him about what he just shared, um, now would be a great time to ask him those questions. Um, I'm also happy to jump to some of the other questions that are coming in the chat, but just wanted to make sure you know this is your opportunity. Yeah, so some of, the, some of the oh, more technical, sorry. sorry, I was just going to say there's questions coming in about PowerShell and automations. That would be great for the second half when I have to jump off because that's really going to be more uh, Adnan and Tim. Um, so I'm just I'm just scanning through to see if there's anything that I might talk about um, generally. So I think, um, so this and there's one, just one question from John uh, Whitfield, uh, what's the best way to have a site for board members that's just restricted to them? So using, that's, that's, in fact, what we have set up for many of our clients, I think the um, there's a couple of things to, to know. So SharePoint, um, when you need to set up a site that includes people outside of your organization, meaning people who don't have an organization account in Office 365 or Microsoft 365, um, there's sort of a two-step process to get them into your site. So you would have to first add them as a guest in um, in your tenant, so in, in Azure Active Directory. And then you also have to add them to the site that you're trying to give them access to. So th there is a little bit of a, um, a, a sort of onboarding, um, there is a little bit of onboarding overhead, but it also then gives you the confidence that you have full control over that content and you can kind of really dial in the permissions um, using all of the same controls in SharePoint that you would use for you know, your, your staff related um, sites. So um, the, in this example that we have here, we're not actually, we don't have an, um, we don't have an extranet connected to the hub, right? Because there's no reason necessarily for the board extranet to be connected to the staff mm -hmm. internet, right? But what most organizations would also have a board page within the internet so that information about the board that the staff need can they can still access that but it would sort of live as its own separate site that had you'd have to manage those permissions kind of independently yeah does that answer the question or did, were there more did you have follow-up that answers it pretty well thank you okay yeah um 
I, and I guess that applies to that the next question from Eric as well. So you're using products like Box to coordinate passing documents. Um, you can, so again, you can um, use SharePoint in that same way. I mean, if you think about it, the board use case is exactly that, right? You're using a SharePoint site to share documents securely with an external user. I'm not really sure what your um, your tech support provider, what concerns specifically they have about security. I would say that using SharePoint is probably as secure, if not more secure than using Box because of that added requirement of needing to add somebody as a guest to your tenant before they can even access the SharePoint site, that there's like a second layer of, of that control. Um, and you can set controls within it so that people cannot share documents, meaning they can't create a link, a share link of a document within SharePoint unless they're the owner of the site. So your external visitors wouldn't be able to say, pass a link to somebody else and say, hey, use this link, you can access this document. Um, and I'm, I'm fairly familiar with Box and I think that there are sort of the same controls there. I don't, I don't know that it would be any less secure. I, I, my impression is that it would actually be more secure than than using box well, well and tony if i could jump in i mean i, I think eric i don't know if you want to uh, jump in as well i mean i think to to share because i think your the issues you're having to you know kind of the the nuance of it is is you know sort of important for folks to understand but i i will say that one of the things from a governance perspective i mean the more platforms that we're managing and supporting and training users on the greater the risk that that somebody's not going to follow the you know the right protocols um, and then it's just a question of, of keeping tabs on these various accounts and systems. Um, so I think from a cost and governance perspective, um, that's a strong incentive to reduce the number of platforms. And I think, I mean, overall, you can definitely, you can do a lot under the Microsoft umbrella in regards to like SharePoint and just Microsoft as a whole in regards to protecting your data but as soon as you start moving your data outside to other services then it just it's not under the microsoft umbrella so you're limited to how much you can kind of control and protect it as well and that's something to always think about is is because that data is is uh is critical yeah i haven't gotten as clear of impression from my provider as as the as I'm not sure what the actual in-depth concern is. My only th thinking is, is because it does require, you know, setting up the permissions correctly. That they're worried that you know, we're gonna we're gonna make mistakes on other parts of the site that we don't want to share with 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 anyone. But uh, I'd I, I'd rather I'd rather use something that I mean I think most of the programs that I deal with are familiar with SharePoint. You, know, you have to train everybody on on Box because it's a little it's a little different. So it seemed like it was would make more sense to use. Adnan, do you want to maybe yeah. talk to that a little bit in terms of like yeah. kind of keeping it a little bit less likely that a mistake will will expose more more than you want? Which Eric is an amazing. That's a critical piece, right? Like that 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 there, right? That that human error is is what it is, right? And so, how do we, if we're going to use that same platform, how do we make sure that um, we're less likely to to um, make a mistake and expose data that that shouldn't be? Yeah, I was just going to add, John. I guess a couple of things there. One item, Eric, is you can actually set expiration links when you share externally. So a lot of times, right, you'll forget that data is shared and other users will move data into those, those folders, let's say. So if you set expiration links for 60, 90 days, right, then you know those links aren't going to be out there for an extended period of time. Um, you know, as Tony mentioned, right, you're adding users via guest invites. So you'll see when that user has accepted that invite in Azure Active Directory, right, as per their email address. So once you see that, I mean, you can look at audit sign in logs as well. Like you'll know that that user and that email is the one that's accepted the invitation and they're really the only one you're, you're sharing with, right? Then you're going to permission them on the SharePoint side, add the, the link so they're expiring. So, you, you know, you have a, a couple of layers of security there, right? Um, again, you could check sign in logs, you know, you know, where they're signing in from in terms of, uh, country and in region and certain information. So uh, I think from a security perspective, right, as, as Tony mentioned, um, it is a, a pretty secure way to, uh, to collaborate externally. 
you can even um, if you know if someone sets a view only um, permissions that you can even prevent people from downloading the documents and, and they'll only be able to view it um, in the browser so there's there's certainly a lot of ways to kind of dial that in I would say that maybe a couple of issues are because of the granularity of permissions it can be really complex and there, there is a little bit of user training that has to happen and so maybe one security risk is that it gets so complicated people just resort to oh, forget this i'm just going to email it <laughs> because it's easier right so there's that potential sort of question and then i would say the other piece is um it requires a certain level of kind of engagement with the IT department. So organizations where it's easy to get IT to kind of quickly add get users to the, or guests to the directory and then quickly sort of enable certain features and functionality, it would be better than, um, I'd, I would say Box is probably a little more user driven, like end user driven than centrally administered than um, as SharePoint is. Thank you. Okay, automation. So we have a couple questions about automation. One, has has anyone created a workflow for, well, this is a little bit different. We'll start here with workflow. Has anyone created a workflow for approvals and routing documents to correct folders, which has some elements of automation in it? And then there is a similar question from Marin. One of the projects I'm working on is a document library that would send reminders to the author owner of the document to make sure the document is still current. Yeah, so those are all things that can be done through Power Automate, which is one of the power platforms that most of you probably have available through your your Microsoft 365 subscriptions. Um, for those specific flows, I would defer to Adnan to, <laughs> to talk about, you know, um, the feasibility of those. I, they sound like things that probably a lot of people have built in Power Automate. Yeah, as Tony mentioned, right, you would use Power Automate and one use case could be, you have a document library with some metadata and when a metadata column, let's say you have a status column, and it, it's set to a certain value, you can trigger off that value, uh, whatever it's set to, let's say it's set to, I don't know, to pending. And then based on that, you can notify or you can route an approval to a, a team member, you know, um, uh, whoever it, it may be that's associated either within metadata or perhaps even in, in Active Directory, maybe it's a manager of an individual, right, who's assigned a task. Um, and then they will receive that approval or rejection uh, in an HTML email within Outlook, and they can actually approve or reject straight from Outlook without having to even go into, into SharePoint. Um, so that, that's a, a typical use case. Um, to speak to the other, um, the other example that was mentioned, uh, we do have a lot of um, task-based implementations where you have team members that are assigned tasks, or let's say you're managing subscriptions, for example. You want to send out reminders after a period of time. Okay, this is set to renew in, I don't know, 90 days, 60 days. You constantly get alerts based on how far out that expiration date is to, to remind users um, to take action. And then once they, they reach that date, you know, you can even set within a list, you have a dashboard, set that row to red so they know it's, hey, this is overdue, um, this needs to be addressed. And then, you know, they can constantly get reminded every day perhaps, or maybe then it gets escalated to someone else. Right? Adnan, if someone were wanting to get a feel for PowerShell, um, what mm -hmm. would be a good way to kind of like play with the tool? So I'll speak to both, I guess, Power Automate and, and PowerShell Taylor. So yeah. uh, on Power Automate, um, you know, you most likely have a, a free license within your tenant. So it's really easy just within Office 365 to go to Power Automate, open it up, and you'll see a section, My Flows. You can create a flow, maybe create your own document library, um, and just start to upload documents. Maybe when a document is added, perform an action, 
um, go into some of the alerting and you'll see it, it's pretty intuitive. Um, I don't think it takes, it won't take much to pick it up. There are a lot of Microsoft learning re, uh, resources as well uh, on the web that you can pick up and you can watch and in videos to start on the Power Automate journey. And then PowerShell is a little more involved. Um, there are references, but you would first need permission to be able to connect to, um, you know, to SharePoint online. So depending on what level of SharePoint admin access, I guess most people on this call perhaps have SharePoint admin permissions. Um, you would need a higher, right, elevated level of permissions. And there are a number of commandlets that you can leverage uh, depending upon what you're trying to do um, within PowerShell. Thank you. So I th I created some poll questions for this. So we're kind of at a lull. I think would this be a good time to throw them out there? Sure. And this is kind of thinking toward the future. Um, so we know how best to <laughs> to work with everyone. And while people are doing the poll, I um, uh, just want to again um, underline that this is this sort of idea of sort of this open forum um, is one that we're we're trying out, and uh, and certainly would love your feedback um, how we can you know again make this um, even better. Um, uh, I hope hopefully that's how you feel, right? Um, and uh, and where again you you feel like there would be uh, maybe beyond SharePoint a, a, a lot of utility to. Um, gathering folks together so that we really maximize the value of LSN tap for um, for the community and and frankly again the, the intelligence the experience of of um, of the providers and the and the leaders who are on this call so it's um, it really is uh, an interactive or, or at least that's our, our hope it's an interactive um, uh, forum. Taylor, you had mentioned there was a question regarding the, if anyone to use the help desk ticketing system. So that's something, you know, I can definitely touch upon, um, you know, whenever you want to look at that. Tony, is there anything else? Because I, mean, I know you're going to be um, uh, dropping off in a few minutes. Anything else that you want to share? Uh, pitfalls, um, uh, possibilities, you know, the aspirations, you know, the things that you, the highs and lows that you uh, want to share with folks? Yeah, I mean, I think the, probably the most important thing is just to realize that um, the tool isn't going to necessarily breed success if you don't manage the change in any implementation that you do. And I think, um, so that's just an important part for any SharePoint project, whether it's um, uses, you know, launching the use of SharePoint, um, you know, completely, right? Like if you've gone from not using SharePoint and all of a sudden like everybody needs to use it, or if you're, you know, expanding certain um, use of features within it, um, you know, the most, the more successful implementations I think are ones where there's a process where you kind of introduce your staff to this idea and then you get, you know, you, you keep them updated on the process. And then um, as you, as you roll it out, make sure that there's um, lots and lots of support available to, to help because it's not um, in certain ways, you starting diving into SharePoint and using office online generally is a big paradigm change for a lot of people, um, especially in the way files are managed. And, um, and those of us that have a little bit more comfort with technology may be able to adapt, but I think it, there's a, often a challenge for others who, you know, find suddenly switching from um, documents saved on a drive to documents in the cloud that are auto saved and, you know, auto versioned and all of that can be can be disorienting. So that that would be the main thing. Um, 
and to that point, I need to hop off and do a training for <laughs> staff at a legal aid organization about their new SharePoint uh, implementation. So thank you, everybody. Um, the rest of my colleagues will remain on and um, hope you guys follow up with lots of great questions. Okay, uh, Marin asked um, a question about RSS feeds. Is there a way to consolidate RSS feeds on a SharePoint site? So to consolidate RSS feeds on a SharePoint site, you would need a third party app. Uh, in Microsoft App Source, there are a number of apps that um, support that type of RSS functionality. And again, one of the great things about the 365 SharePoint environment, right, that it's, it's a lot easier to start to integrate other applications. Okay, and um, Adnan, you were thinking uh, we would review the admin hub, the ticketing system. Yeah, let, okay. yeah. Let me just share my screen. And as as Adnan's doing that, again, any other topical areas? If you folks just want to put it in in chat or or jump in, just just so that you know, if you felt like you came here for something. Uh, we want to make sure that you you're leaving uh, with with some uh, some information or some um, jumping off points at least. Sorry, let me just see which screen I'm sharing here. Okay, screen two. Share. Okay. Do you see um, the SharePoint site that says help desk? Yes. You do. Okay. So I, I believe the question that was sent to you, Taylor was related to whether anyone had used the, the help desk template. Um, that, that's what I'm assuming the question was. Like when you go to the, the settings, you can see there's apply a site template and Microsoft has a number of templates here and one of them being the IT help desk. So that template has been applied here and I just created a, a team site and then added the template after the fact. And you can see this is the interface they use uh, similar layout to what Tony had showed with a hero web part and some links. And if you were to click here to submit a new ticket, this is the interface. And what they've done is it's really native out of the box SharePoint. They've created a, a list for tickets with a number of fields you would typically use issue and priority status uh, assigned to, which you can populate. Um, and then you know, once you submit it, you'll see the data in this list. There isn't any functionality as it relates to, to workflows like Power Automate, where you'd probably want to alert users um, and add some additional functionality. So uh, I mean, to summarize, this might be a good starting point, but to be honest, you can probably create the list yourself, um, build out the fields that you need, or you can come in here and alter it, but there isn't much functionality built into this um, as it relates to, to automation or anything additional that would add a lot of value from what we saw from, from testing it. But as, as you said, you could build in some of the, the automation. You, it, it's, you're not getting the automation you want out of the box, but you need to think that through, you know, design it in, in some, in Visio or something else, how, how you want the flow uh, to work and then build it out. Yeah, exactly, John. So here I'm I'm on the the ticketing list they've created. Then in theory, I could go to, to Power Automate from here. Or I could open up Power Automate separately, create a flow off of this list, and then add the actions that might be relevant to this, whether it's alerting or escalation, you know, reminders, et, et cetera. But you would need to build out a lot of that. Now, conversely, I think John mentioned, right, there's a whole ecosystem of apps that exist in, in Microsoft App Source that vendors have created. So you can probably find some help desk apps, some may be free, some may not be free, they may be a subscription, but that might be um, better suited for you, it might be built out already. So there might be a trial you can leverage as well as it relates to that. Is anybody using anything like this for the ticketing system? And, and again, there are some, you know, purpose built ticketing systems that you could basically sort of integrate into your SharePoint site. Um, 
so it doesn't everything doesn't have to be you know on, with the SharePoint logic, um, and uh, and so it you know I guess it's I guess to always think about is, should this be an app in SharePoint or should this be something that's purpose built and it really depends on your needs for sure but uh, um, but you know free and low low or low cost ticketing solutions are are numerous out you know there are lots of systems out there that that might fit the bill um, for not just for IT but for other uh, HR or finance related um, uh, work that's that's handled by multiple people. Yeah, John makes a good point, right? You can embed that an iframe into your SharePoint site here. There's a lot of integration within Power Automate to third party applications as well, uh, maybe to even submit data into that ticketing system, right? So you have a lot of options on that front. Anand, while you're sharing your screen, do you think you could review the SharePoint admin hub and some yeah, of the settings sure. there and see if you have questions on those? Yeah, so Taylor, I was thinking since we're we're going to do that, maybe it's a good idea. We had touched upon um, external sharing yeah. and how that works. Maybe we start there, right? So here I'm in the, the Office 365 admin center. This is a, a test tenant, right? So I'm in settings, organizational settings, and then I'm going to go to SharePoint where it says control external sharing. And you can see the options here, right? Only people in your organization, which is pretty strict. There's no external sharing allowed, existing guests. That means that user has to already exist in, in Azure Active Directory, new and existing guests where we can actually invite guests um, as well as um, users that are already in Azure Active Directory or anyone which is wide open, which we strongly discourage. So here our setting is new and existing guests. So the premise being you would then invite users in, in Azure as guests, send them a guest invitation, then they would become a new guest right, within your Azure Active Directory. So now we're going to jump to the, the SharePoint Admin Center and here, under policies and, and sharing, you can see these sliders, right? With SharePoint and, and OneDrive. And these are both set to, to new and existing guests, right? We never want to, I actually can't move this slider up, right? We never want to set this to, to anyone. I mean, I, I say never, but we, we have had clients where they need an extra net where they can share with anyone and they understand the risks then, right? The slider would have to be set to that level. Um, but this is the layer that's now controlling SharePoint and OneDrive as it relates to your entire tenant, right? The, the entire ecosystem, right? Then when you go to your active sites, there are not many sites here, but as you select the, an individual site, right? So now we, we have the tenant level settings we've gone through, the SharePoint level settings. This is the, I would say the third layer. There's a a setting on each individual site. So for this particular site, I can set this to new and existing guests, existing guests or only people in organization. I cannot, you can see anyone is grayed out because our organizational settings prohibit that, right? I couldn't do that, which is, which is good. So let's say I set this to new and existing guests. There's some additional options here in terms of expiration of guest access. We have this defaulted to, to 60 days, those are our organizational level settings. You can deselect this and, and alter those settings. And then there's some additional settings here for the default sharing link. Again, this is set to our organizational settings, which is only people in organization. Now, ideally, this should be set to people with existing access, and we'll go into that and, and show you why. And this is where Tony mentioned the default link permissioning. By default here, it's view and not edit, right? So now if I were to go to this particular site, now within this site, right, once it loads, let's look at the actual site permission. So this I would consider the fourth layer of uh, security and permissions. Now you'll notice here, change how members can share. And this is set to only site owners can share files and folders, right? Because yeah, as you've probably experienced, if users can come in, they can click on the share link and you know, sharing can, can really grow out of control over the years. So you need to make a decision. 
you know, do we want to allow members to share or should it only be site owners? Um, I mean, typically, depending upon the site, you most likely would have members would have the ability to, to share as well. Um, but this is that, that site level setting, right? And then one thing which is a, a bit confusing to people, when you go into a file and you click on share, right? If this is set with people with existing access, right? This is, uh, I wanna send someone in my organization who has permission to this file, uh, a link to it, right? And I'm using this link. Now, if I were to share this with someone else who didn't have access, let's say people I choose and it's someone else in my organization, what happens is this file will have unique permissions set on it, right? So it will actually go into here one second. So what you would see if you were going to advanced permissions is this would have, it would actually look like this. It would say delete unique permissions because the file would have unique permissions. So when you when you do that and you're not selecting people with existing access, SharePoint's actually creating these sharing links for you and creating unique permissions on each file or folder where you're performing that operation, right? And it actually doesn't just do that for the sharing link because copy actually behaves the same way. But why? Uh, I can't explain that. It, it's it's not very intuitive, but that's the behavior. And that's something to keep in mind because you can imagine over time as users are performing these share and, and copy actions, you're gonna have all these sharing links, right? And and then how do you how do you manage that, right? When you when you have hundreds of thousands of files within your your intranet, right? All right, Taylor, maybe I don't know if there are questions, but maybe I'll I'll, I'll stop talking. Thanks for sharing that about the share links. We've had a number mm -hmm. of clients run into that um, and people saying, somebody can see this and they shouldn't see this. Someone can see this, this finance document and they shouldn't be able to see it within the same organization. And, and then we kind of help them figure out how to share without creating the custom share links and custom permissions for each document. Okay question that I have for you next from the chat is, um, are there any additional tools available to improve the basic search through files stored on the site? Often find the search is overboard and have had many staff express frustration when a site gets large. Yeah, so this, this now is, is the modern iteration of SharePoint, right? That's responsive, the new modern, modern architecture. In the old classic architecture, you can create an actual search page in search center and you ha actually had additional search functionality. So you are a bit limited as it relates to your search options here, right? I I'm searching for a file and well, it didn't, it didn't find that, but your search options um, are just the advanced search that appears um, you know, within SharePoint now, you can't really customize it much. You can use the, the keyword queries, such as let's say, I know a file starts with test and I am the author, or I know the first few letters of the author's name. Well, unfortunately, I only have two files and they're both mine, <laughs> but there's a keyword query syntax, right? That you can leverage with file name and, and, and wild cards to narrow down the results. Um, but beyond that, right, that's, uh, you know, you can tag your data as well. And on the metadata side, that can help you filter. But outside of that, you're, you're really, um, that, that's really what you have natively now with, with SharePoint Online. Yeah. Well, and so I, I, I just, I think that this is also sort of part of the trade-off. I mean, Microsoft makes SharePoint so affordable for legal aid or for nonprofits that 
um, it is sort of balancing. And I think a lot of organizations, I mean, there are some that are going with purpose-built DMS solutions and, um, you know, with, with that are sort of more built out or more sort of um, uh, somewhat more functional, but they come at a, at a significant premium. Um, you know, so I think it's, it's important um, maybe before you get into a SharePoint um, a DMS project, you know, search, I mean, I think Eric, it's a great question. Um, you know, search is a, one of those critical needs, What? how much functionality are you comfortable with? And, 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 and it may be that your users really don't know until after their, you know, the, the, the site has gotten quite large. Um, but, you know, if you, I think Taylor, you mentioned this earlier, if you're integrating, um, you know, for instance, your, your documents, um, I'm sorry, your, your case related documents with, you know, case management system like legal server, um, and you're separating, you know, you, you can sort of do a little bit more of a design to kind of keep things, um, uh, uh, segregated and, and improve, I think the, you know, the search results. Uh, and obviously going through your case management system to get to your documents you know, that are specific to a particular client yep. will we'll narrow it down. Legal server isn't, isn't super, sorry, I'm gonna, legal server isn't super document search friendly. Like, I mean, I think we're all legal aid groups. We've all got one probably big central issue of compliance, which is did the advocate get their retainer and upload it to legal server or upload it to whatever case management system you're using. Did they get the citizenship thing that oh, LSC citizen, requires yeah. and mm -hmm. the state funder? They probably got one other document that you need at least. And the testing for the presence of those documents, I think is like the central, you know, the holy grail of compliance. If I could go through all my files on, on my site and say, do all these files have that document present? It may not be yeah. filled out right. That's okay. But if, if, yeah. I, if it's at least present, I get like 90, I'm 90% on my way. Yeah. Legal server isn't super, legal server has great reports otherwise about the characteristics of the cases and the characteristics of time entries, but it's document search is just not there. And I really tried to use, to find a way to use SharePoint to kind of, mm. to, to, I was hoping a SharePoint integration and maybe a third party tool if in SharePoint would let me do that, where I could do a test report of, these are all my open cases, this is my list of open cases, and these are all the ones that have a retainer on it. At least at least there's a document scanned on it that's, that indicates, in, in dish of this retainer or the LSC citizenship. Right. Yeah, if that would be, I don't know, if anybody could come up with a way to do that, because a lot, most of us on this call are probably using legal server it's a good chance, yeah. and most of us are using SharePoint or some something else. But some tool that would do that would solve an, <laughs> a, a nationwide compliance problem that I can have the advocates check all day. Oh yeah, I did scan up the retainer, but half no, I have time. But it's well, not. Well, it's Eric, not ninety percent they did it. Yeah, I mean, I think so. So we did something to address that back when I was at Legal Services NYC in in twenty twelve when we when we moved to that system, and and basically we had you know, uh, alerts on the case for the attestation and the retainer. And so those are specialized, you know, um, uh, actions that needed to be happened. And then you would associate the document with that. So you would upload it and that would make, make it compliant. So I think you really can do it in legal server. It's not intelligent, you know, to your point, it may be that they didn't actually sign the retainer, but they uploaded a document. Um, mm -hmm. There are other tools again, and I don't know about the add-on, maybe add-on can answer that, you know, certainly other DMS um, tools that you will, you know, you can basically sort of identify elements of the document and and make sure that it is, make sure that there's signature on it um, that would give you a higher confidence level. But um, but when we had a program visit, um, you know that uh, they loved it. I mean, yeah. You know, and I don't. That was not like something we needed uh, legal server development on. It was it was pretty straightforward. So it was just building in into your 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 basic case profile um, mm -hmm. the alert. So it would say when you opened it up that that these documents weren't present. And also when you ran a report, you knew that they weren't present as well. Hmm. So it's, it's not uploading it as just a regular document, a random document to the case file, but uploading it specifically for these purposes. Okay, thank you. Sure. And, and just to add on to that, John, as you mentioned, right, there's this entire ecosystem of apps and previously we were able to, to write custom code in the classic version of SharePoint to customize it in the modern version use something called SPFX. Um, so in the in Microsoft App Source, I mean, there may be other 
search applications that that meet your requirements. I'm not, I'm not sure it's a it's a massive ecosystem of applications, so that might be one place to look. But uh, what John mentioned, right, seems like it might be doable. I don't know if those those retainer files with a certain naming convention, if there was, you can probably create something on the Power Automate front or have a report that was run weekly or daily that would say, hey, we're missing these retainers or these attestations for these case folders. Um, we're probably talking about a few thousand, right, folders, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it could be right that if they don't select the metadata for retainer, you know, or, or maybe you wanna have two selections so that it's not an errant selection two different meta fields um, if you really wanted to do it in SharePoint. But I, I'm, you know, it just, it just depends sort of what, what your staff are, are comfortable with. I mean, you know, in, in New York city, we were able to get them to do it through the, because we, we also had, you know, uh, professional intake staff. And, um, and so they would make sure that that uh, attestation got signed. Um, uh, you know, so even if the case handler was a little, negligent um it, it ended up happening and i'm thinking out loud here i mean if we were to create like automate a subfolder creation um that said you know client attestation and finding a way to identify if uh, that folder was empty that means that there has no attestation that's been signed and then use that as the case alert for legal server um, might be a way again like having each case basically um, automate a subfolder that says attestation. That folder's empty, it um, pops up a case alert on legal server saying that that folder was empty and so there needs to be an attestation signed. Um, yeah, that, that is a good idea. But I think that uh, John, you are right on the spot with legal server, you can go ahead and use, uh, use case alerts and other, other blocks to help you identify um, documents that have not been signed and use that field to populate the metadata um, on the SharePoint side to help you filter out those cases, but um, different different ways we could think about that. There's a follow up question about um, search, and that's from Glenn, and he asks, does search include searching through content with files, WordPerfect, Excel, PDF? Um, and Glenn, I don't know if you feel comfortable unmuting, but I was wondering if if what you're getting at is the, the ability to limit the search results by file type, or are you just wondering what is what is it searching through when you type in the search bar? So, Taylor, I, I can speak to that while Glenn is um, responding. Okay. So in, in terms of limiting by file type, you can see here, right? I did file type is Excel and nothing came up. Um, and here, when I do docx, it comes up and in the UI as well, you can definitely limit by file type. As far as what is searchable, any Microsoft applications are searchable and any OCR PDF files are searchable as well. So if you can search in Adobe, for content, right? On a PDF, if you upload it to SharePoint, it will also discover that content. WordPerfect, I think was, was mentioned. Um, I'm sorry, I meant, I'm I have not, no I meant Microsoft Word. No problem. Okay, that's, that's I was fine. just, I no, was we, just we guessing have, what WP meant. <laughs> you know, we have clients that use Word, a couple okay. that use WordPerfect. So no, I thought it was a legitimate question. Um, but yes, it, it should discover all that, uh, all the content, all those file types that you mentioned, and you can limit it as well. Okay, so anything inside that file I can search for. Exactly, it's, it's like Google, it, it's crawling and indexing all your content, except the results are security trimmed. So if you do not have permission to that content, it will not be discovered in search. Gotcha, thank you. Okay. Is it searching, I'm sorry, I missed this. Is it searching the, the words in the document itself? Yes. Okay, okay. Um, we have, I believe, about six minutes left. Um, I'm wondering if there's any interest in um, data migration. Or Shelly, are there other questions that people submitted before the session too that you feel like we didn't get to? Um, no. If if I had the question, it was passed to Taylor. I don't think we had a lot. So okay. 
so migration were or again, like you know, what are maybe the? I think the 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 change management um, and sort of what are folks struggling with in terms of getting their um, their users um, to adapt or to to you know uh, move forward in the way you you need them to. Um, and again, I think there's some probably some solutions in this group. So sorry, do we want to touch upon the? Just go over the migration, or it wasn't totally clear. Or are we waiting for additional questions? Well, why don't we go over migration, and if folks have any sort of bigger, yeah. sort of project level sort of questions, or you know, what what keeps them up at night, they can they can share chat, you know, on what what those are, and maybe we can talk about that. Sure. So back into the the SharePoint admin center here. There's a migration tab. So as long as you're a SharePoint admin, you'll see this. And then you'll notice Microsoft now, in order to facilitate organizations moving to Office 365, has added migration options within Migration Manager for Ignite, for Box, for Google Workspace, for Dropbox. So you would, if you want to migrate from G Suite or Google Workspace, I guess it's called now, you would just need to have that admin account as part of the connector, enter those credentials, and then you can map it to, the, to a destination within the SharePoint site and a SharePoint document library and similar for Ignite and the other cloud applications. If you have a large amount of data on your network share and you wanna migrate that to SharePoint, what you would do is there are migration agents here and you can see you would actually download an agent, uh, which is an executable, install it on, it could be on a desktop or a server, and then it would run, you would see it come up here under agents. And that's how you would facilitate the migration of data. You would need permissions on that agent endpoint to the, the file share you're looking to migrate. And then you would supply a, a mapping file of the source and destinations um, SharePoint site and document library you want to migrate the data to. Um, and depending upon your upstream bandwidth, right, it, it might take a while to migrate if you're trying to move a couple of uh, terabytes. But this is a powerful tool we, we often use to migrate clients' network shares into, into SharePoint. And then let me just go back. If you do have a legacy on-prem SharePoint environment, 2010, 2013, and 2016 are supported via what's called SPMT, the SharePoint migration tool. And that has to be installed on your network from an endpoint that can reach that on-prem SharePoint site. It can connect to it um, and probably a farm farm admin account on SharePoint on-prem. And then you can migrate that content to SharePoint online. There was a third, a third option here, Microsoft Mover that we use to migrate from OneDrive to SharePoint or SharePoint online to SharePoint online. And Microsoft recently deprecated that due to security and compliance concerns. So that is no longer an option. I think in the chat, there was a question about how to move uh, a document library from one site to another. So there's some, a few options there. You can either, you can use a copy to or a move to depending upon how large it is. Um, if it's, you know, a few gig, that'll probably time out. If it's smaller, that might be a good option. Um, you can, sorry for the sirens, I'm in New York City and I'm at my windows open. Um, the other option is a Power Automate script you can write to actually copy the files from a source a site and document library to another one. You can use the OneDrive sync potentially, sync it down locally, and then um, sync it back to another site. So you have a few options there as it relates to, to migrating that type of content. Rucha, would you like to add about um, what you need to do to get ready to migrate? Yeah, I mean, it really does depend on your organization and how your organization is going to be using SharePoint, but um, a lot of the, the clients that we've seen um, that are moving into SharePoint have to do a lot of cleanup um, and prep their files in order for the migration to happen smoothly. And so again, uh, taking into account the different integrations that you're using, um, like we talked about the legal server integration, one of the, the main things that we need to do is to prep and stage those files so that the case related documents fit the naming convention um, that is supported by the integration. And so um, a lot of these 
these things like, again, the staging and the prep of the, the data does take a lot of time and change management and it involves your entire staff. And so making sure that they're on the same page and creating a, a timeline for them to follow um, does really help smooth the migration process. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, it is three o'clock, so our time is up for today. But if you did not get all of your questions answered, please let us know, and we will certainly try to find answers for you. Um, I also, um, we have an exit poll, so we really are interested in hearing your feedback on this session and getting ideas for future sessions that are similar to this. So please take a moment. I think there's only th three questions in the poll, and they're not required, so you can just do um one or two but we do appreciate you taking the time to do so and thank you so much for joining us today thank you to all of just tech staff <laughs> for joining us and have a great afternoon goodbye everyone thank you.